Hello there everybody, Sam Strains here, welcome back to The Railway and welcome to my very first review of 2021. Up to date I have a brand new Backman diesel to show you. I say this is a new diesel, it was actually announced quite a while ago back in 2010. However, recently I noticed that it had returned to Backman's range and I thought they just looked too nice to miss. So the locomotive I have today is this, it is the Backman LMS 10,000 or 10,001, uh, the one in this box is number 10,000. And there's something very special about the diesel in this box, or at least the prototype in real life. If you don't know what that is, stay tuned. I will talk about it later on. But yeah, this model looks very, very cool, doesn't it? Obviously, it's in the BR Black, which is unusual in itself. But these locomotives were actually built by the LMS. And so this livery really, despite having the BR Early Crest, is an LMS livery, which explains why it's completely unlike any other diesel we've seen before. Anyway, I bought this one from Derails Models, who are a great retailer, by the way, very quick to display batch which is quite useful for me as a reviewer. It cost me £157.20 which is obviously an awful lot of money for any model particularly one that's 10 years old the RRP being £184.95 so obviously this model will have to be very 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 impressive in order to justify that price tag. However I said the same thing of the Backman Class 37 and if you remember that one was really really impressive despite its age so I think this is newer than the 37 but it is about £15 more expensive than the 37 so we will see high expectations obviously but uh, I reckon those expectations ought to be met just looking through the front of the box here looks really really lovely doesn't it so here we go the Backman 10,000 LMS diesel let's get this out and see what it's like so I've already said quite a lot about how unusual this livery is, but I haven't said much about how much I actually love it. It's so, so striking, isn't it? Obviously, your BR greens, your BR blues, your rail freight greys, those liveries are all fantastic, aren't they? But they're not quite like this. I mean, if you've got one of these on your layout, even someone who knows nothing about them is going to notice a livery like this and be quite impressed by it. And that was me, you know, obviously when you first see these things you have no idea, but this one obviously caught my eye. Let me show you the end of the box then. So this is the version I have, it's 31-999. It is the LMS 10,000 in the BR Black and Chrome Early Emblem, and it does accept a 21-pin DCC decoder, which is pretty cool. That's obviously quite standard. Let me flip the box over and show you the brief history. So there you go. If you want to pause and read that feel free to although I will give you a bit of information on these logos and what makes them so special a little bit later on there's only two of them by the way that's why they're both specified on the front of the box both running numbers now, that's unusual you don't see that very often right come on then I've not actually had this out of the box at all so far so this will be the first time sorry I've just giggled slightly because uh, it triggered my OCD being slightly to the right hand side of the box but uh, obviously that doesn't matter it just means that it's within the window yeah this is the first time I've actually seen the whole diesel in the past it was just sort of this portion of it yeah it's reasonably small isn't it I don't maybe I was expecting it to fill out the box I do like that slightly small size it's almost cute isn't it and cute isn't normally a word I would use to describe diesels but I think with this one I can just about get away with it and wow taking this out of the box reveals something else the roof that's very interesting not only is it sort of silver which is unusual but it, it has a sort of noticeable sheen to it as well look at that it's really not far from a chrome effect I don't know if the real thing would have been true high shine chrome, possibly. Obviously, I don't think anybody's seen them for, well, they were scrapped quite a long time ago, so I don't know if anyone will still remember little details like that. Uh, I suppose there might be some photos. Anyway, let's stop waffling about that. So we have the instructions here. So this is the general information. It shows you the location of some screws. That must be for body removal, I would assume. You can see there's some switches on the bottom. Uh, DCC decoder fitting, that's fine. It's got lights, obviously, that's good. Lubrication, uh, buffer beam parts, that's fine. They must be in the detail bags. And there you have it, there's the exploded diagram. And I'm glad to see that this has a really high quality mechanism, just like all of the other high quality Backman diesels I've looked at, including that centrally mounted motor with dual drive shafts. Going to the bogies, which appear to be all-wheel drive, although I will investigate this later on and uh, deliver you a, a full presentation on the various aspects of the mechanism. 
And then we've also got this, maintenance and care. This is a booklet. Maybe this is a bit more generic. We'll find out. Running in period, cleaning and maintenance, lubrication. Most of that we've already been told about. Uh, and yeah, this is just about the collector's club, product warranty. Nothing of very much interest to see there. So let's take this sleeve apart then and have a look at the loco inside. Now, something has caught my attention in the detail bag. So let's pull that off and see. Yeah, we've got, look at this, Royal Scott nameplates. I have no idea it would come with those. I don't know if they were on any of the listing images. That's very strange. We'll have to look into that as to why those are included. Obviously, a bit more recognisable are those screw link couplings, which are also included. So if you wanted to fit those to the buffer beams, then you obviously could do. Although bear in mind, they probably would foul up the couplings, which are pre-fitted, the NEM couplings, that is. Uh, so yeah, you probably want to choose one or the other, won't you? Anyway, let's pull this out then and see what this is like. Wow, that finish on the top is really, really impressive. The more layers I strip off this, the better that is shining. Look at that. Right, let's pull this out then and see what the weight is like. Oh, it does feel pretty heavy. It must be said very, very heavy. And there it is. Wow. That livery looked good inside the box, but it really does pop now, doesn't it? I love it. I love this silver trim on the black. That looks marvellous, doesn't it? But it's a real pity we didn't see more diesels like this, actually. But anyway, yeah, this is really quite hefty. It does feel pretty good in the hands. There's an awful lot of detail, and obviously the decoration appears to be second to none. Yeah, I'm really, really liking the look of this. So we're going to take a close look at this beautiful locomotive. I just can't get over how wonderful this one looks. I really hope this is as good a runner as the sort of Peak and the 37 because if it is, then it's just going to be a joyous model to own. And so it should be, obviously, for the, frankly, insane amount of money this cost me. Anyway, a little bit of history then on the LMS 10,000 and 10,001. And then we'll get this up onto the white background and I'll show you some of the details. So as well as obviously standing out for their striking looks, twin diesel locomotives 10,000 and 10,001 were also noteworthy for another reason, that being that they were the first mainline diesels built in Great Britain, which is quite a claim, isn't it? The pair were built at Derby Works between 1947 and 1948, and they were later classified as a D16-1, so you might see them referred to as that. The pair originated from the LMS, which obviously explains the livery, who commissioned them, and George Ivat, who is usually known known for the design of many steam locomotives, was responsible for the overall design work. The LMS deemed these locos to be equivalent to a Class 5 steam locomotive, or a Class 7 when used as twins, and they were later classified as Type 3 diesels, which is a more conventional classification for diesels. Both locomotives were sadly retired and scrapped after a reasonably short service life, with this example being withdrawn in 1963, which is only some 16 years after it was completed. So there it is then, up close and personal for you, the Backman 10,000 LMS diesel locomotive. And if, like me, you were persuaded to buy this on the strength of how darn good these things looked on the listing images online, then I think you did the right thing. You won't be disappointed because the livery, the finish, the locomotive looks every bit as fantastic as it did on the internet. And so I'm really, really pleased with this from that perspective. From a slightly different perspective, I'm not really seeing very much to justify that massive price tag. Obviously, an extraordinary price tag does demand an extraordinary model. And even though I really like this and I'm looking Looking for ways to justify that price, I really am. I do think this cost too much and that I didn't really get what I paid for. I'll talk a little bit about that first and then we'll get on to the pros because there are a lot of those. I mean, the livery, while it's very unusual and very nice, don't get me wrong, there's nothing particularly complex about it. We've seen other diesels which were much more complicated in their livery application, so there's no major cost incurred there. The locomotive body is also very plasticky. In fact, all of the exposed bodywork is just made of plastic, and that goes for the grills as well, which are just part of the moulding, it seems, and obviously made of plastic. For over £150, I was expecting better. We don't even have sprung buffers. These are just static buffers. They look very good. They're made of metal, but they're not sprung, so they haven't even pulled out all of the stops on the detail. And as you can see through the side-facing windows, there is nothing to see behind those. You've just got the, well, what I assume is the chassis block or the chassis block cover. If you look at photos of the real locomotive, there would actually be stuff to see behind there. So it's not as though this is ultra-realistic either. The weight, I have weighed this. This is 499 grams, which is fairly heavy. I don't think there's going to be a problem with that weight at all. It is, however, 
however, lighter than the Class 37 and the Class 45. The Class 45, I think that's understandable because it's quite a lot larger. The 37, though, is more or less the same size as this. So the fact that this is more expensive and yet lighter is, again, a little bit puzzling. However, this locomotive is really, really nicely put together. I can't fault the build quality and the livery application, and even the detail is really, really decent. It's just not quite meeting those expectations set by the price. Let's look at some of the decoration then. So you've got the running numbers here. These are not just tampo printed onto the body. The numbers are actually extruded out from the body, which means I suppose they must have been incorporated into the tooling, meaning that they must have a different tooling for number 10,001 because it's got a different number. That's really quite impressive. You've got other printed details such as the British Railways early crest there, that looks very decent, and underneath the running number on the left hand side you've got what I assume is a builder's plate. You guys now will know whether that is the case or not because my close-up lens will show that. The door handles and door handrails appear to be separately fitted. The door handrails look a little bit chunky, don't they? However, that is absolutely accurate by the looks of things. The real thing did look like that as well, so that's fine. No opening doors or anything like that. The doors are just static, but I mean, opening doors is quite a, a rare feature, so no complaints there, really. The lining or striping, whatever you want to call it, again, that is part of the moulding. It isn't just tampo printed on. That is really quite impressive, and it goes all the way around the ends as well. It's actually quite clever how they've been able to decorate that. You can see a little bit of a join here and there but overall it's very nicely done as is the roof uh, I think the roof actually displays that chrome finish quite a lot better with all these studio lights on that I've got in here it really does shine doesn't it and looks fantastic you have a real physical fan underneath the grill on top there whether that is motorized or not I don't know but if I do blow it yeah, you can see it does spin, so it's loose inside there. So I don't know, maybe if you, if you wanted to motorize that, you could do. That might be quite fun. And then you've got these separately fitted horns on each end, which are nice, fine pieces. I think those are just plastic, and they look very, very thin. So obviously, beware of those, because you don't want to be breaking them. The glazing is done very nicely on the cabs, too. It's nice and flush with the outside of the body, and those glazing pieces are complete with separately fitted windscreen wipers, which looks lovely. Each end is complete with silver painted lamp brackets, which look wonderful. And I believe those headboards that were in the detail pack actually fit onto the upper lamp bracket there. I believe I haven't tried that, but uh, yeah, as I understand it, that's how it works. As you can see, the bogey detail is lovely as well. There's tons of molded detail on there, as well as a few separately fitted parts, such as the ladder beneath the cab entrance there, which is lovely. The axle boxes are also separately painted, helping those to stand out. And the wheels actually match the livery quite nicely as well. I don't know whether that's intentional or not, but the tyres and then the blackened centre of the wheels really does match the livery beautifully, which I think is excellent. Now, first of all, I will show you the back cab, um, because that offers the best view of the cab detail. As you can see, the cabs are not dreadfully realistic. The cab floors are so high that you can actually see them just looking at the locomotive normally. Quite unrealistic, that. Which also means if you wanted to fit some crew yourself, you would have to amputate their legs. And as you can also see, there doesn't appear to be much or any painted detail inside there. However, the issue of crew isn't too important because on the other end, as you can see, we do have some figures pre-fitted inside the model, which is wonderful. Backmen do seem to do this quite often, and I love that. They're also painted, as you can tell, which help them to stand out. And yes, we do have two of them, not just one, as was the case on the 37, I believe. And while the presence of crew doesn't quite excuse the cabs from being quite unrealistic, they are the kind of feature that would help to justify such a mighty price tag, even though the number of impressive features like that are relatively minimum on this loco. Anyway, very quickly let me show you the underframe. Most of the details here are just a part of the moulding, which again just makes the model look that little bit less realistic. However, on the very underframe you can see that there are some separately fitted parts there and they do look a bit more realistic, don't they? Overall, the level of detail is not too bad, is it? If this would have cost me maybe 30 to 50 pounds less, maybe I would be much more complimentary about this model. However, just, you know, 157 pounds when you start thinking about some of the other models you can buy for that money or less, this doesn't look so great on the value for money standpoint. However, quality seems absolutely fine. It's heavy, it's well built, I can't see any glue marks, the livery is applied nice and tidily. Yeah, if you really want an LMS 10,000 or 10,001 locomotive, these are not a bad shout at all. They look wonderful, and I have to admit, I love it. I really do like this one. So I'm going to look at the mechanism. I'll feed back to you on that. And once we've done that, I'll get it down onto the track and we will give it its first ever test. 
So there it is then, one of Britain's very first diesel locomotives down onto the track, ready to run. And you know what? The mechanism is actually pretty decent. Let me show you around. So first of all, if I flip the loco upside down, you can see we do have proper bearings on every single axle, which is fantastic. Turned metal bearings, very, very good. The slight downside to that is that those bearings also do the pickups. You can see there is like a brass piece which connects all of those together. And I'm not a fan of that for two reasons, really. First of all, they get dirty faster. And of course they do because uh, they're removing electrical contact. And obviously dirty bearings produce more friction, meaning that this will need to be serviced more often than a locomotive that has traditional wiper pickups. The other reason is that there's a good chance your choice of lubricant will be unsuitable here. Me, for example, I use light sewing machines oil um, which is not conductive so if you put that on these axles to lubricate them you will hinder the electrical connection which again will produce more dirt which means at best the loco will need servicing more often or at worst it would start hindering the performance so that's not fantastic that's made even worse by the fact that the middle wheels on each bogey do not pick up it's only the outer wheels which means that only two-thirds of this locomotive's wheels do some picking up which for over 150 pounds and in this day and age isn't very good I don't think I think that needed to be improved on this latest release. Every single axle is driven though, so that's very, very good. We have got all six axles doing driving, which is very good. Body removal was a little bit convoluted because there were eight screws holding the body on. I think that's a bit over the top as well. It's unnecessary expense and it just makes disassembly a bit of a headache. However, once you get the body off, you can see we do have a very nice heavy metal chassis block, which contributes a lot of the weight. You've got that fairly chunky centrally mounted motor. I'm not certain whether or not that is a three or a five pole motor, so I guess they will get the benefit of the doubt there. However, usually the performance does the talking on that, so we'll see. The wiring is so neat and tidy. Look, there's not a wire in sight on top of the circuit board. It's really, really neat. And you've got these spring-loaded copper contacts which do all of the lights and everything. That's really, really good, isn't it? So neat and tidy. There is the 21-pin decoder socket. I don't think you'll have any trouble fitting a decoder into this because there's no wires in the way to faff around with, so that's great. And you've even got the facility to fit a speaker if you want to, and yes, there are contacts for that as well. So the mechanism looks really, really good in my opinion. Um, not perfect, I think the pickups should have been better really, but overall it's really quite impressive. Now then, let's get this thing running and see how it goes. Now, this has not been running yet. We will have to run this in properly for a good 30 minutes in each direction before I can give a sort of verdict on the performance. But straight out of the box, this is how mine behaves. So this is what you can expect as well. Here we go, set it to forwards and let's turn her up. Hoping for good results here. Okay, I thought I saw a twitch there. Oh yeah. Okay, it's going. It's jumping a little bit. Are all the wheels on the track properly? I think they are. Has it got square wheels? No, it might just be going over the points actually that's doing that. It's not too bad. Okay, so the performance looks really, really good and smooth, straight out of the box. I'm very pleased and impressed with that. I've also noticed that the lights appear to be working. We've got cab lights, and they're sort of warm white slash orange. I'd say they're more orange than warm white, and they do illuminate the cabs and also the crew, as you can see, which is great. And then on each end, you've got the head and tail lights. The headlights, again, are orange, but the tail lights, as you can see, are a nice bright red, and they are quite nice and bright, these. Even in a brightly lit room like this one, they're noticeable, which is really good and that goes for the cab lights as well. Yeah, you know what? That is really decent, isn't it? It's not stuttering on the points or anything, and that's to be expected. Yes, it hasn't got all-wheel pickup, but it's got enough so that it shouldn't be stopping on points. So that's really nice. Let's go at 50% speed. There we go, that's 50% speed. I don't know if this has got flywheels fitted, because it does stop dead. I'll have to check the diagram, actually, to see whether it has. Yep, there's the diagram. The flywheels are definitely shown on there, aren't they? So it's a bit strange that the performance doesn't reflect that, although perhaps once the mechanism's had a chance to loosen up, that will improve a little bit. We'll have to wait and see. But let's bring this back and try a bit of a crawl, shall we? Let's see how that goes. Okay, trying to get it there. So at the moment... I don't think that is performing quite as smoothly as that Class 37 from Backman was, straight out of the box. Um, I'm not going to say that for certain until this is run in properly, but straight out of the box I would say we have seen better because that is a little bit inconsistent, isn't it? However, at the higher speeds, obviously, that is more than smooth, isn't it? 
yeah, I really like that. Right, well, let's get this running then. We will see how it handles the layout, see if it handles curves all right, see if it does any slowing down, see if it slows down on Gordon's Hill, etc., etc. And then after it's done about 25 to 30 minutes in each direction, I will check back in with you and we can try the slow speed and everything else once the loco has run in. So here we go, 50% speed. Let's see how it gets on. All right. So this one's not dreadfully speedy. I didn't see any particular slowing down on that second radius curve. That suggests then that the Loco itself has been geared to run reasonably slowly, which is quite interesting because the slow speed wasn't outstandingly great, was it? And usually when a Loco has been geared to run a bit slower, you do tend to see better slow speed performances. However, maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit. After it's running, then I think we can make a, a firmer conclusion on that. But for now, it seems to be running very, very nicely. It's not derailing. It's not noticeably inconsistent in its speed. So as far as performance goes, it's looking quite promising, isn't it? So I'll be back as promised. See you in a second. Okay, folks, there we go. Running in has completed with no major issues, I'm pleased to say. The thing ran absolutely perfectly. No derailments, no stalling, no cutting out. Very, very good indeed. I have noticed one alarming issue, though, and that is a almost complete lack of torque in this mechanism. It's probably one of the worst I've seen for this. Let me show you. So I'm going to back it out of shot. Then I'm going to send it forwards again at 50% speed, but I'm going to put my finger in the way to stop the loco moving along. Watch what happens. There we go. Now I'm not going to do this for long, but if I show you a close-up on the wheels, you can see they are stopped dead. Look at that, they're not turning at all. The Loco hasn't even got enough torque to spin the wheels while the Loco is stuck. Now that is not normal. If I show you the Backman Class 37, I'll do the exact same thing. You can see the wheels are moving very, very easily. And that is a major problem on a model like that. Well, it's a major problem on any model. Manufacturers must choose motors that are powerful enough to spin the wheels of the locomotive even when it's stationary. That is so important because if a modeler overloads a locomotive with too many coaches, it's important that that motor doesn't stall. And let's say something derails or something else goes wrong. It's important that even if the loco is brought to a stop, the motor is still allowed to spin because a stalled motor draws so much more current than a moving motor because of the lack of back EMF, which means that after a very short period of being stalled like that they're going to be burning out they're going to be getting too hot it's just really really silly i can't understand why they wouldn't choose a more powerful motor for a loco like this and it does show through on the pulling power i measured attractive effort of 0.59 newtons which is way below that class 37 i measured one newton on that class 37 which means that while the 37 could manage 55 coaches this thing can only do 37 coaches and bear in mind that the more coaches you add you're not going to start getting wheel slip the motor is going to start running slower and slower and slower until it just can't move the coaches at all and that is going to damage motors that is really silly it is going to lose points for that because there's just no excuse for it on a model this expensive Anyway, as you can see, I've set up some LMS coaches. There aren't too many noticed. There's only seven there because I really don't want to be stressing this motor out now that I know that there's no damn torque in the thing. So let's try the slow speed again before I go and couple to the coaches. Let's see how that is. Has it improved at all? Because it wasn't particularly good. But of course, now that we know that the motor's pants, uh, that probably explains why it wasn't so good. Well, not so smooth anyway. Yeah, it's exactly the same. It's very, very slow but it inches forwards rather than in a single smooth motion. So there we go, yeah, you can see that that is just inching there. Let's turn it up a little bit, can it do better? No, even at that speed it's inching. See, see the difference? If you go and watch the Class 37 video after this, the performance is totally different and yet the mechanisms are very, very similar. It just seems to be that the motors perform differently, they behave differently. I haven't looked at the motors side by side, but just working from memory, I'm pretty sure the 37 had a much larger motor than this one. It didn't look so beefy in this. Could be wrong, though. Could be wrong. Anyway, yeah, so the slow speed's not fantastic, even having been run in. It's not bad, don't get me wrong. That's more than usable. But, um, yeah, a good slow speed demonstrates a good quality mechanism. And uh, yeah, the slow speed of this model is betraying that slightly shoddy motor a bit, isn't it? Anyway, let's go and couple to the coaches then. Let's see if she can manage seven of them. I should hope so. Okay, steadily does it. Is the coupling hook at the right height? Sounded good. 
Yes, of course it is. There we go. So bikemen have got the basics right. <laughs> well, except for the motor, I suppose. Besides that, yeah, the basics are correct. And it works well. It must be said, the performance isn't terrible, don't get me wrong. There you go. Perhaps there's also some sort of friction in the mechanism as well, because if I just cut it off, you can see it stops dead. That's quite unusual for a Loco that has two very large flywheels inside it. So yeah, something not quite right in the design of this one, I'm afraid. Anyway, on the middle line, the, today's theme, by the way, is going to be Backman Diesel. So see which others you can spot. And there is an odd one out. This is a much better quality one in terms of mechanism, at least. That is the 45. Mentioned that a couple of times today. Very decent run of that one. There you go, with some coaches. And then on the inside line, uh, one of my favourite Backman Diesels. It is, of course, the Class 37. I've talked about this one quite a lot. This one is so much better in terms of performance. It's like the model performer, actually. It's incredibly good. Uh, if every loco ran like that one, I might as well get rid of my performance category because it would not be needed. But yeah, there we go. Let's catch up with the 10,000 then and see how it handles those curves and Gordon's Hill. Okay, here it comes. We're looking out for any slowing down. Okay, so no, not really. I would say it is a little bit slower. That's probably because of the incline. But uh, on the second radius curve, it was fine. And I did check the gauging, by the way, and the gauging was absolutely fine. That's with seven coaches. I wouldn't really risk many more than that, to be perfectly honest with you, just to be on the safe side. And uh, just in case you were thinking it, no, adding weight or bullfrog snot to the wheels or something, that would not help. In fact, that would make the problem even worse. It is a torque issue, not a wheel slip issue. But yes, to be fair to this, it's very nice and smooth, isn't it? It is very, very nice and smooth. And the fact that it's not dreadfully powerful is reasonably well masked if you just couple it up to, well, as I have, seven coaches. With a modest number of coaches, the issue does not manifest itself at all. So it's not exactly the BT well tank, is it? But it could be better, I suppose. Beauty though, isn't it? Absolute beauty. I just love that black, that BR slash LMS black. It's gorgeous, isn't it? I've got to try and get I think the bullied leader class is in a similar livery. Was it Kerno did that one? Oh, it makes me want to try one of those now too. Let's have some ratings then for the lovely Backman LMS 10,000 locomotive. Now, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look so good on here, does it? There's nothing in particular that's wrong with this model. It's just got a lot of very small issues, which obviously add together to eat away at the score quite a bit. Let's start on detail then. I've given this three star. Now there's a lot to be said for this model where the detail is concerned. I mean, the livery looks fantastic. The finish is lovely. I love that sort of satin finish it's got. And there's a few nice features such as the uh, crew inside the cab and the bogey detail. But at the same time, there are quite a lot of aspects of the detail which are quite outdated and aren't really that impressive in 2021, particularly at such a high price. Remember, this cost £184.95 RRP and I bought it for £150 seven pounds so the lack of sprung buffers for example that's not really on is it if a model doesn't have them that's fine but they need to be reflected in the price i wouldn't want to pay this much for a loco without features like that the cabs are really unrealistic no painted detail inside and the floors are really unrealistically high you've got plastic grills none of them are extra or anything like that yeah the level of detail wasn't as good as i was expecting it to be the performance gets a kind of a benefit of the doubt here. I've given it four stars. It loses one star for its poor crawl, uh, which isn't absolutely poor, but we've obviously seen better. It's not terribly smooth. On the layout, as long as you don't overload it, it does actually handle the track very nicely. It's reasonably constant in its speed. It doesn't slow down on curves and it handles moderate amounts of coaches fairly well. The pulling power though isn't very good at all. I measured 34 coaches with this, uh, with a tractive effort of 0.59 newtons, which is way below the class 37 at one newton. I mean, that could handle 55 coaches. And the reason is obviously because of that lack of torque. The motor isn't very good in this. So be very, very careful about loading this up with coaches because like I say, there's a real chance that you'll damage the motor on these if they're stalling because they're hauling too much. The mechanism then, I've given it three star. I was hoping to give it a higher score on the mechanism, but ultimately I've had to knock it down a little bit. Now, overall, it's really quite decent. You've got all of those metal bearings on the wheel set. You've got a nice tidy circuit board. All of the lighting works on spring-loaded contacts. You've got dual flywheels. 
generally it's a decent mechanism. It just lost one start for the pickups, which are just silly. I don't really like pickups going through the axles for reasons I've explained, and also the motor. I don't know whether it's three or five pole, I haven't been able to find out. Usually I wouldn't knock it off a star for being a three pole motor if I don't absolutely know for sure that it's a three pole motor. But in this case, it doesn't matter because there's just no torque in the mechanism. And because the mechanism itself is decent, I have to suspect the motor. I'm not sure, but that's what I suspect. The quality though, I have to give it five stars. Yes, the bodywork was a little bit plasticky, but you have got all of that metalwork inside behind the body, which is really good and heavy. It's been assembled to such a high standard. There's no glue marks, the decoration's perfect. Everything's fitted to the model as it should be. Yeah, the quality, I'm gonna give five stars. Value for money then, now as I say, I paid £157.20 for this. At that price, the model had to have been better. It needed those sprung buffers, it needed those extra details, it needed to be powerful, it needed to impress me at that price tag. And even though some aspects of the model certainly did, overall, I don't think it is worth what Backman are charging. And the price sets unrealistic expectations about the model, which only leads to disappointment. It's fairly obvious that this model is not a particularly expensive one to produce, yet the price that Backman are asking suggests otherwise, which I think is unreasonable. So overall, then, you've got a bit of a mediocre score here, 6.45 out of 10. Had it been cheaper, I think that score would have been much better. A five star on value here would have really saved the score. Overall though, let's put it into the 2021 logbook. There we go, it's second below the Backman 1P. As I promised I would, I have put the 1P into the 2021 ranking, so it has a chance of being in the top five at the end of the year. Overall, not disappointing per se, but I had hoped it would be better. So it's a little bit disappointing, yes. I am very pleased with this overall. Yeah, don't get me wrong, I'm glad I bought it. But it's got the same old Backman problem, hasn't it? They've obviously got uh, too high an opinion of their own models because while I'm very happy with it, there's no way it was worth what I paid for it. And that price tag is ludicrous, isn't it, really? It needed to be much, much better than it was in order to justify that. But as it is, yep, yeah, it's a great looking loco, runs reasonably well. The detail is okay, isn't it? It's okay, that's the summary, really, it's okay. If you really want one of these and you can find one, because Backman haven't made many, but if you can find one at a reasonable price, then sure, go ahead, as long as you know the pros and cons, you can do much worse than one of these. So there you go, that is my review. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed that. That was quite an interesting first review of the year, I would say, and I did enjoy it, I did enjoy it. Yes, it wasn't the best, but it's a welcome addition to my collection by every means. Very, very nice. Right, well, thanks for watching, folks. I will see you very, very soon for another review. For now, though, thanks again for watching, and I will see you very soon. All right, cheers, folks.